Good afternoon. We are thrilled to welcome you all to another exciting and inspirational episode of Concord Conversations. This is an initiative by Concord Medical Group to educate, empower, and encourage our community about our health so we can all live to our fullest potential. Did you know that colorectal cancer is the second leading cause of cancer-related death in both men and women in the U.S.? It is one of the most preventable types of cancers. And our goal today is to help you prevent colon cancer. Hi, I'm Dr. Katherine Weinberg, Director of the Adult Congenital Heart Disease Program at Lenox Hill Hospital, part of Concord Medical Group. And I am joined today by two fabulous colleagues. Both are board certified gastroenterologists. We have our amazing Dr. Liu and our outstanding Dr. Barraza. Many of you have already sent in excellent questions, which we will be discussing today. If you have any additional questions, please ask them in the chat box. We only have 30 minutes together, so we will try to go through as many as we can. Remember, we are giving general guidance. If you have a particular question about your health, we want to help you. Come in and talk to one of our amazing physicians so we can answer your questions and give your health the attention it deserves. Let's get started. Dr. Barraza, what is colorectal cancer and who is at risk for it? Thank you for having me. Um, hello, everyone. Um, that's a great question. In very basic terms, colorectal cancer is an abnormal growth of un, uh, in, that really begins in the colon and or the rectum. Um, usually it begins growing there and sometimes in advanced stages can affect other organs. In terms of who's at risk, uh, men and women are both affected. And although we know certain communities are um, maybe more at risk, all ethnic, ethnic backgrounds are affected. So everyone really can be affected by colon cancer. All right, Dr. Liu, why is screening so important for colorectal cancer? Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me back to this exciting uh, conversation, Concord conversation. Uh, yes, so screening is very important. Why? Colon cancer is a uh, preventable disease. Why we say so? Almost all colorectal cancer begin as the uh, polyp, uh, which is the uh, growth um, on the inner surface of your colon. So removing those polyps can prevent them from growing into colorectal cancer. That's why screening is so important. We're looking for polyps and then to remove them if found, and this can definitely prevent colorectal uh, cancer. Okay, so what are the symptoms, Dr. Barraza, of colorectal cancer? Uh, it's important to know that colon cancer can exist even if there are zero symptoms and there are no lab abnormalities or anything like that. So that is why we do screening tests. But some of the symptoms to be aware of relating to colon cancer include things like unexplained abdominal pain, any amount of blood in the stool or when you have a bowel movement, um, unintentional weight loss, anemia, excessive fatigue or weakness, these are uh, signs that may be associated with colon cancer and may be reasons to come see a gastroenterologist in our practice. All right, great. So when should I start screening? When should I be uh, screened for colon cancer? Dr. Liu. So a lot of people now recognize, and this is a, a relatively new recommendation now, it is currently recommended for people without uh, family history of colorectal cancer to start screening at age 45 instead of 50. This is uh, relatively new since a couple of years ago. Um, so of course, if people have a family history of a colorectal cancer, uh, that could be different. And then you're welcome to come to our practice and then we'll discuss with you when will be your appropriate time to start colorectal, uh, colorectal cancer screening. Okay. So what are the options for screening, Dr. Barraza? Great question. Um, in general terms, there are three main categories for screening for colon cancer. The first category is end endoscopy, which includes our gold standard and most preferred test, which is a colonoscopy. Um, a second category of screening are stool-based testing. There are two main types of stool-based testing, including Cologuard, which is very widely um, publicized, advertised, and many people have heard about this. The third category is a virtual colonoscopy, 
which involves no virtual reality or anything like that. Instead, it's actually done uh, using a CAT scan machine, um, and that's the third main type. Got it. Dr. Leo, what about a blood test? Are there any blood yes, tests? Yes, a, a lot of people in my clinic can do ask so whether we have a, a, a better way to do this or whether there is a blood test available for colorectal cancer screening. Unfortunately, we do not have uh, any approved blood test for this purpose yet. Uh, we do know there are like some cancer markers and people are using, but those are for confirmed the diagnosis of uh, uh, colon cancer. Okay, Dr. Liu, do you want to explain exactly what a colonoscopy is and what we're looking for? Yes, so um, colonoscopy is uh, basically we're using this instrument, which is a flexible uh, scope, a kind of a flexible tube, and then the size is about my, maybe my pinky um, size. And then we insert this tube from the anus and then going through the rectum and also the whole colon. The purpose of doing this is to uh, visualize the inner surface of your colon and then look for polyps. And if we see any polyps and then we remove on the spot. All right, we've been talking a lot about polyps, Dr. Barraza. What exactly is a polyp? So a polyp uh, is basically a small growth that begins uh, on the surface or lining of the colon or rectum. Um, there are different types of polyps. Um, some of them have the potential to continue growing over a several year period and developing into colon cancer, and some do not. Um, so all, all the polyps that we find, and we're very good at finding polyps, um, end up with uh, being reviewed by a pathologist that, who then gives us a report to explain exactly the type, which helps us determine when the next colonoscopy should be. Got it. So who needs a colonoscopy, Dr. Liu? Great question. Colonoscopy is actually the gold standard for colorectal cancer screening because it's a very uh, visual that we can see the inner lining of your colon. And also it's very therapeutic because if we see polyps, we remove right away. However, this is a... Um, it's, it's actually more recommended for people who do have family history of uh, colorectal cancer and or they have a family history about so-called high-risk polyps because the chance of uh, their um, having a colon polyps is higher than the average uh, people. So colonoscopy is highly recommended in those people. Okay. So you know, lots of people are nervous about getting their colonoscopy. And the reason they're really nervous is because of the prep, right? So what yeah. exactly is the preparation that's necessary for a colonoscopy? Yeah, so this is a very, very common concern. It's unfortunate that colonoscopy has such a bad rep. It's, it's really the preparation and specifically drinking the, the liquid to cleanse your colon out is really not as bad as a lot of people have it in their minds. And the reason I say that is not because I'm here trying to sort of have you kind of come on board to get a colonoscopy, although I think everyone really should. But I always ask every single one of my patients who come on the procedure, how did the um, diet go? How did the prep go? And the vast, vast majority say it was really not as bad as they had thought in their head. But in, in general, in order to get a colonoscopy, there is a little preparatory work that's involved. You will have to follow a particular low fiber diet for a few days. And the day before, you'll be on a liquid diet for the day. Um, and in the evening, yes, you will drink a, a liquid, a laxative liquid that will clean your entire colon out so that we can um, see the surface and look for these polyps. Um, the liquid is taken in split doses. So one half at one time and then another second half at a, at a later time. But it, again, I'll just emphasize, and I say this because all my patients give me feedback, it's really not so bad. That's right. And then the uh, liquid uh, laxative medications is the uh, most commonly used. I do get questions in, the, in my practice uh, asking whether we have a tablet or we have a pills instead of a liquid because uh, that's a decent amount of uh, uh, liquid people have to drink. Um, we do have a tablets, however, those are uh, uh, quite a lot of tablets that people have to, to, to take. And then sometimes they do cause like side effects, for example, cramping abdominal pain. And it's not widely used. And then because it's not as effective as the uh, liquid options. Um, so like Dr. Barada says, it's, uh, it's, uh, we do have several options in terms of the liquid laxative medications. And then 
then you can come into our office and then we can discuss with you what would be the best option for you. Yeah, so it's uncomfortable the night before, but it's not terrible like people think. So people shouldn't be as nervous. All right, so are there alternatives, Dr. Barraza, for less invasive screenings? And what are those alternatives and are they as accurate or reliable? Um, that's a great question. You know, like I just said, you know, colonoscopy does take a little bit of work um, in order to, to do it well. And that's always our goal is to get it done the right way one time so we don't have to repeat it for those, in, for those reasons. But in terms of invasiveness and that sort of things, you know, alternative methods may be slightly le maybe less invasive. A stool test, for example, just requires you collecting um, a specimen and sending it to a lab. So that's pretty non-invasive. But it's also on the flip side of that, you know, it's important to understand what those types of tests are looking for, what they're intended to protect. Um, they really are looking for advanced lesions, advanced polyps, or um, early stage colon cancer, which obviously can certainly be cured and managed. But you just have to know what, you know, what they're intended to look for. During a colonoscopy, we also look for advanced lesions and polyps, but we're also looking for very, very early stage uh, polyps that can be removed and not even giving them the opportunity to grow. Um, you know, a, a CAT scan is also considered less invasive because it doesn't require anesthesia. Um, and I think these tests are an important part of screening. There's certainly a rule. I just think I like to tailor everything for my patients. So typically we would review your history and any concerns and everything like that and pick the right test that makes sense for you. Yeah. So Dr. Leo, a lot of people ask about Cologar because we see those commercials all the time. Can you explain what it is and is it as good as a colonoscopy? So yes. So col Cologar, a lot of people do ask about that and then it is a stool test and then it detects the blood in the stools and also DNA of uh, advanced polyps or colorectal cancers. So it's a, it is indeed a quite sensitive test. And then that's also why we do tend to get a false positive uh, result. And then people are very nervous about it. And we call this is a approach of, a, it's a two-step approach because once the colorectal is positive, then the next step is to do a colonoscopy to figure out why it's positive. And the false, the negative uh, um, result is in general speaking acceptable. It's not that high. Uh, so if it's a negative result uh, uh, on your colorectal and you are good for three years and then after three years and then we can reevaluate and then think about what would be the next uh, colorectal uh, cancer screening uh, approach for you. Cologuard has been a great addition. It's another tool in our toolbox to screen, but I just would also, um, you wanted to add that, you know, a positive result on one of these tests doesn't necessarily mean that something um, awful or concerning is going on. That being said, once a positive result comes in, you know, it is advisable to have a procedure in the um, near future to kind of confirm or follow up what that exactly means. And again, not every positive result uh, is something to be concerned about. So one of the hot topics in uh, colonoscopies is the age, what age we should get a colonoscopy at, right? So it decreased from 50 years old to 45 years old. Can you talk a little bit about that, Dr. Liu? Yeah, so uh, that's true. This is a relatively new uh, recommendation. A couple of years ago, we lowered down the starting age from 50 to 45. Why? Uh, because over the last 10 years, uh, we have data showing that the rate of the colore uh, colorectal cancer has increased, especially among people younger than 50 year old. Um, and then the incidence rates has actually uh, doubled. So that's why after um, powerful uh, cost effectiveness of studies and then um, all the guidelines, including our guideline and also Cancer Society, uh, all recommended to start colorectal cancer screening at age 45 for people who have average risk. Got it. And is there a maximum recommended age for colonoscopy? Um, yes. Um, if you uh, have no history of uh, uh, colon polyps, and then actually the benefit of uh, 
um, screening decrease after age of uh, 75. However, for individual cases, people have a, a family history of uh, colon cancer or people have a significant uh, personal history of uh, colon polyps. This can be discussed as an individual case by case um, and also pending on the medical conditions. And then we'll have to evaluate the benefit and the risk of uh, continuing to do uh, colorectal cancer screening after age 75. Um, Dr. Barraza, someone asked, is it dangerous to have a colonoscopy if you have a tortuous colon? So a very curvy colon. So a tortuous colon is simply that it just means that it takes um, extra turns, which is a normal variation of anatomy. Um, that condition in, in and of itself is not, does not increase the risk of the procedure um, per se. It may make the procedure a little bit more tricky. It may take a little bit extra time to maneuver through those turns, but it doesn't, it's not that I'm aware of associated with an increased risk. And of course, we take every single precaution to do things safely and under direct visualization. We're not doing anything risky or anything like that. All right, Dr. Liu, how often do you need a colonoscopy? Oh, great question, because I get that a lot. Uh, in the clinic. So this depends on your family history, um, whether you have family history of uh, colon cancer, uh, also depends on your personal history, whether you had a prior colonoscopy and then showed that you had a colon polyps. And then also depending on the current finding on this colonoscopy, and then we come up with the uh, a recommendation about the interval, when would be your next uh, recommended colon cancer uh, screening colonoscopy. If, let's say, if you have an average risk without family history, without personal history of a colon polyps, the uh, recommended interval is uh, 10 years. Okay, Dr. Barraza, do I need to take the full day off of work after a colonoscopy? Can I drive home after a colonoscopy? What are the precautions I need to take um, after a colonoscopy? So uh, the recovery is very um, easy. Typically, what we say is once the procedure is done, within 30 to 60 minutes, you're awake and alert and able to walk out of our endoscopy center with your escort. For the rest of the day, uh, you can eat as you like. We generally say no alcohol, though, there, because there may be lingering effects that may kind of uh, add, it, add up with the anesthesia that you just had. We also just caution you, you know, no major work or life decisions. Take the rest of the day off. However, the following day, you can kind of resume everything back to normal. Okay. All right, Dr. Barraza, what can I do to prevent colon cancer? Does diet and exercise help? That I love, I really kind of love this question because, um, you know, sometimes people view colon cancer as something that's just genetic, insurmountable, and sort of out of your control, but that's not necessarily the full story. Um, we know that for example, um, not smoking cigarettes or smoking cigarettes increases your risk of colon cancer. So quitting or not smoking cigarettes at all can reduce your risk of colon cancer. Similarly, at drinking excess, excess alcohol increases your risk. So I always recommend to drink in moderation or abstain from alcohol. Um, additionally, dietary changes can certainly be helpful. Um, reducing the amount of red meat that you consume, reducing the amount of processed meats, these things will definitely reduce your risk of colon cancer. And um, following up sort of a healthier diet, a mostly plant-based and high fiber diet along with exercises, uh, exercise and in certain cases, uh, even a modest amount of weight loss, these are all things that you can do to lower your risk of developing colon cancer. So there is some control that you have over this. Great. Dr. Liu, there's a lot of talk about using aspirin. I, as a cardiologist, I use aspirin every day. Does aspirin decrease your risk of colon cancer? Yeah, actually a lot of uh, our researchers are working on this and then seeing whether aspirin is going to be a good uh, preventative uh, medication for people uh, to prevent colorectal cancer risk. Um, data does suggest there is a trend. Uh, aspirin may reduce uh, polyps. Uh, growth and the colorectal cancer uh, risk. 
However, I think this also, as far as we know, also increased the risk of ulcers and the increased the risk of uh, bleeding. So the data, the, the evidence is not strong enough that we are ready to recommend as a routine practice uh, to give aspirin to prevent the colorectal cancer yet. But if you do have a low risk of bleeding and then you happen to have a cardiovascular disease that your cardiologist recommended you to take aspirin, it may benefit uh, preventing um, colorectal cancer. Dr. Braza, there's a great question in the chat box. What's the difference between a polyp, a hemorrhoid, and I'm going to add an ulcer? In general terms, a polyp is a growth um, that comes from the lining of the surface of the, uh, the colon, and it usually has a uh, cellular component and other glands and things like that. So that's what a polyp is. A hemorrhoid uh, happens in the rectum or the anal area, and it's typically an engorged blood vessel that can sometimes cause pain, itchiness, or bleeding. And so it's not, it, that does not, uh, unlike a polyp, a hemorrhoid does not carry any risk of um, colorectal cancer. An ulcer is uh, similar to on the surface. It involves the surface, but rather than a growth coming upward, it's kind of a depression. Uh, it's like the lining of the surface, it has worn thin and it's kind of eroding into the surface and kind of cratering deep, in, deep into the surface. And so that's what an ulcer is, but that's a great question. It is a great question. Okay, let's see, um, Dr. Barraza, is there a genetic component to colon cancer? Um, yeah, so, you know, there are genetic syndromes and genetic mutations that are strongly associated with the development of colon cancer. Typically, um, when this occurs, uh, we think about these conditions when there are multiple generations and several family members that are affected either by colon cancer or other cancers of the um, gynecologic organs or other organs. So there can't, um, those are pretty uncommon though. Um, but yes, it is possible that uh, colon cancer can arise from a genetic mutation that can be heritable and transmitted across generations and families. It's pretty uncommon though. Most, most colon cancers arise from just a, a small polyp that occurs from a spontaneous mutation, not, not quite the same. Okay, so Dr. Liu, if I don't have anyone in my family who has colon cancer and I have no symptoms, I'm just 45, do I need a colonoscopy? You do. You do. Like uh, we mentioned earlier that most uh, colorectal cancer, they are silent tumors and then they, they grow very slowly, but you may not notice any symptoms until they are uh, big. So um, given the data we have and given the, um, the, the, the experience we have when then at, at, after you reach at 45, even though you don't have any symptoms, you don't have any family history, uh, you should consider this seriously because uh, colorectal cancer is a preventable disease. So the sooner you take out the polyps, the better you do. Correct. Right? Uh, if you, Dr. Barraza, had one step to recommend to our viewers how to improve their health and start today, what would it be? I, I love this question. I kind of always, you know, if any of my patients are watching, I think they'll probably uh, tell you that I probably told this to them. I, even though I'm a medical doctor, I always look for natural and, uh, ways and approaches to solve medical conditions and problems. And in relation to colon cancer, I'm a very big advocate of following a healthy diet, um, mostly plant-based, high fiber, um, reducing the amount of animal proteins and specifically red meats and a healthy amount of exercise. These are ways not only to improve your overall health, but specifically to lower your risk of developing colon cancer. That's always my go-to. All right, Dr. Leo, what's your uh, answer? I, I want to say prevention is key. So pick up your phone today and then call us and then we can help you make an appointment. Yes, because the sooner you take out the polyps, the better people do. Right. Correct. So thank you everyone for joining us for another inspirational and educational episode of Concord Conversations. We know many of you have additional questions and we'd like to help you come in and speak with one of our amazing physicians about your health. We care about your health. We care about you. Thank you so much for joining us today.